Good morning, Bucknutters. Welcome to the Bucknuts Morning Five here on Monday, January 23rd, 2017. I am Dave Biddle. Very happy to be joined by Steve Hellwagon. Steve, it sounds like uh, Thayer Munford is going to join Ohio State's 2017 class eventually. He would be the 20th commitment if he does commit um, here in a short period of time, either today or tomorrow, whenever it might be. Uh, he's a four-star kid, Steve. He's you know ranked as the number... 14 overall player in the state of Ohio, according to the 24-7 Sports Composite. Um, ranked as the number 279 overall player in the country, the number 30 offensive tackle in the country, kid out of Maslin. I mean, Steve, this is a kid, and I love Jim Trestle. This is a kid back in the Trestle regime. He would have had an offer like 18 months before signing day and would have committed. <laughs> but So I'm glad to see this come to fruition. It's kind of late. But just uh, your thoughts on Thayer Munford likely being a Buckeye and what type of uh, player you think he can be. Yeah, I got to see Thayer Mumford at the uh, Friday Night Lights camp last year. I think he was down for a couple of the camps. And he was playing at Cincinnati LaSalle, and then he moved up to Maslin uh, basically to live with his high school coach, I believe Jason Hall is his name, who moved uh, from LaSalle up to Maslin. And it created a little bit of a problem. The OHSA, I think, accused them of recruiting, and he had to sit out some time or, or whatever the situation was. So uh, he was still practicing, though, which is good. And uh, it sounds like, from all indications, that uh, you know his academic situation was a little bit of a concern, but it looks like it's all systems go for that. And it sounds like Ohio State is ready here in the last week before signing day to see if they can add him to this class. And as we know, space is very tight for Ohio State. I mean, by my count, they're already three or four over the scholarship limit uh, based on guys we know who are leaving and those type things. So they may still need to clear out some space to be able to add some of these guys that they're uh, looking to uh, add here at the last minute. But uh, he would be a great addition, I think. He's got the size. Everybody knows that. And uh, I'm sure that uh, they have uh, done their due diligence uh, on him, regardless of whether he's played any football or, or whatever the situation has been, that uh, he's a guy that they think can help him in the Big Ten. Yeah, I'm excited about it. I like to, I like, you know, it seems like when Ohio State takes a quote unquote flyer on a player from Ohio late in the process, Almost always it works out. I mean, guys like I think about even Malik Harrison hasn't proven it yet. He's the most recent example where everybody's just talking him up. He was a guy that last year, very late commitment to the class, very late offer, and a lot of fans were like, who's this guy? What are they doing offering this guy? And there's been many other examples over the years. So, um, you know, I, I, I love this. I hope that uh, this, this does happen for the Buckeyes. Um, let's move on to some Ohio State basketball. Um, Steve, you've covered many um, – you know, uh, eventful um, games in your career, you know, many momentous occasions. Uh, you got to cover the first uh, win by Northwestern in Columbus in 40 years, and maybe I'm jumping the gun here, but I think this is a game you absolutely have to win if you're going to make the NCAA tournament, if you've already dug yourself a hole. Um, and Ohio State wasn't able to do it, and you know, maybe they can go on some crazy streak and get back in the NCAA tournament conversation, Steve. But uh, just a disappointing loss yesterday. Your thoughts? Yeah, because things had seemingly been going pretty well here the last couple games, even though they weren't uh, decisive, you know, defiant wins. I mean, they beat Michigan State by five at home. They beat uh, uh, Nebraska by one on a layup at the buzzer, basically, at, at Nebraska, and they came home. And here was Northwestern, who had won 12 of their last 14 games, going back to the non-conference, and was sitting there at 4-2 and two in the Big Ten and had had the week off after beating Iowa by 35 points last week at home. So uh, they were playing good ball. They came in, and, um, you know, it was kind of a back-and-forth game for the most part. Uh, one team would surge ahead, and the other one would reel them in, and back and forth it would go. But uh, down the stretch, Ohio State could not throw the ball in the ocean. Really, the last three minutes of both halves, Ohio State was absolutely miserable 
And uh, if you combine, well, it's actually the last eight minutes of the first half. They made three baskets in the last eight minutes of the first half. And then, uh, obviously, the uh, the end of the second half until uh, Lyle and Potter hit those, you know, last-ditch desperation three-pointers to get them back to within two, I believe, with maybe 20 seconds left. Uh, <clears throat> you know, it was just not the kind of showing that they needed. <clears throat> and they got the help off the bench that, that they've been dying to have. They had some guys come in off the bench and help out with uh, C.J. Jackson, seven points and six rebounds. Uh, Micah Potter, I think he had uh, seven or eight points as well. Uh, and, you know, they were getting the help that they need off the bench. But Mark Loving, once again, you know, after a couple of pretty good games and hitting that game winner at Nebraska, he just had nothing to give. Five points, five rebounds, uh, three turnovers. I mean, just just didn't get anything accomplished. Two of eight uh, from the field and um, gave up a bad turnover for a layup with about three minutes to go late in the shot clock and also missed a uh, free throw for the end one that would have cut the lead down to one with about 10 seconds to go. He missed the free throw. So you figure uh, you get it down to one, you, you foul, you give up two points, you at least have a chance to shoot a three at the end to try and tie the game and force overtime. But, uh, you know, you hate to say it comes down to one thing, but uh, it was a lot of things with this game. And, and bigger picture, you know, as you talk about, I mean, the team's now 12-8, and eight, uh, two and six, does that sound right? No, two and five in the Big Ten is what they are, I believe. And it's just not going their way. Next up is Minnesota. Then at Iowa, they absolutely have to win these two games this week. Uh, Minnesota at home, team that beat them up in Minneapolis, and then uh, Iowa, a team that is really scuffling. Uh, although I guess you'd say Ohio State's really scuffling right now as well. But yeah, long and short of it, it's not good. And of course, uh, the game thread after the game filled with who are they going to get to replace that mod? I think public opinion's running about 90-10 against Mata right now. Uh, just not not uh, not what people figured it was going to be. This is basically the same team as last year, and they're worse. And I don't think people understand why that's happened. And uh, no development out of uh, you know most of these players. Loving is not any better or more consistent than he was as a freshman, and he's three years into this. So. Yeah, a lot of questions and not many answers. I guess we'll have to see which way the wind is blowing with Gene Smith and uh, what uh, what he's really thinking because uh, unless they start reeling off some wins, this very, very, very well could be the last year for Thad Motter at Ohio State. Yeah, very rough day for Mark Loving. He was even worse than I'm accustomed to seeing him, and I'm, I'm used to him being you know, a disappointing player. It's just a very rough day for him yesterday uh not a rough day for nate ebner <laughs> he goes to the super bowl now for the second time in the last three years was a part of the patriots super bowl championship team super bowl 49 two years ago patriots really destroyed the steelers yesterday and they will go to the super bowl nate ebner of course uh, an all pro second team all pro this year as far as uh special teams a guy that wow. walked on at ohio state after never playing football before, was a rugby star growing up, still plays rugby, was on the United States rugby team in the Summer Olympics in 2016. So, uh, I mean, this guy is like, they have the most interesting man in the world commercials. You know, Nate Ebner's in that conversation, I think, as the most interesting man in the world. And a kid from I, yeah. a kid from right here in Hilliard, Ohio. Let me throw that out there. We always say Columbus. I, I live specifically in Hilliard, so that's another thing. He's from Hilliard, so... I just couldn't be. I'm not. A, I, I really kind of hate the Patriots, you know. But I, I love Nate yeah. Ebner, so I guess that okay. mitigates the damage a little bit. They think he should spend some money on an advertising campaign with him because he runs down on punts and the punt returner falls down, you know, or something. Yeah, you know, just, <laughs> <laughs> just uh, again, the Olympics in the Super Bowl in one calendar year. That is, you know, or in a 12 month period. That is. Uh, that is pretty, pretty amazing stuff, and uh, I'm sure he's going to have a lot of stories to tell when this is all over. And as you mentioned, he was in the Super Bowl two years ago with them, correct? So uh, this yes. will be another chance, and he's the only Buckeye, as I understand, nobody on Atlanta. And uh, Steelers, obviously, uh, Ryan Shazier, his dream of getting to the Super Bowl was 
was uh, camped out, and so for uh, Corey Lindsley uh, with uh, Green Bay didn't make it. But uh, hopefully we'll get a good game. These championship games on Sunday were terrible. Uh, I don't think – I mean, I was at the Ohio State basketball game. I don't know that I watched more than – two series of that first game it was a blowout and then kind of turned back and forth on the second game because it was a blowout as well so you know hopefully we'll get a good game finally in the Super Bowl and it looked like Matt Ryan the Falcons are are, are gonna put up a fight so uh, hopefully that's what we'll get I want to close the show talking about what kind of impact do you think Kevin Wilson can have I think everybody you know, just thinks he's going to come in and just wave his magic wand and we're going to see just, you know, record-breaking offense. Um, and maybe we will. Maybe we will see a record-breaking offense. Tom Herman was able to come in and do that, and they, they obviously have plenty of talent on this team. Um, what are reasonable ex- expectations right away in 2017 for Kevin Wilson in this offense? Uh, that they win them all, Dave. You know that that's the reasonable <laughs> expectation. <laughs> of course. Columbus every year. Well, yeah. Yeah. Uh, in, in all seriousness, though, seriousness, seriousness, though, I think what you're going to see is a blend of what he did with Sam Bradford and uh, Jason White at, at uh, Oklahoma, what he did with Nate Sudfeld and uh, Richard Munchy Lego there at uh, Indianapolis or Indiana, and then uh, what Ohio State's been doing, which is the uh, the power game out of the spread formation. Uh, I think you kind of meld those three things together into something, and then you fit it to the personnel that you have. What does J.T. Barrett do effectively? You don't have an Ezekiel Elliott or a Carlos Hyde thumper like he did have at Indiana with uh, uh, Redding Divine or Divine Redding and then uh, uh, Coleman, the guy who was really good a year or two ago. So I think uh, you got to figure out, between those three schemes and the personnel that you have and the teams you're playing, what's going to be the best uh, best way to attack? And I have no doubt in my mind that between Urban Meyer and Ryan Day and uh, Kevin Wilson that uh, they're going to get to the bottom of this and uh, get it figured out. Uh, Greg Stubrawa is also a veteran assistant coach, so I think that they are going to get this thing straightened out and uh, – you know, it would not surprise me if, 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 if they were able to run the table next year. There's no reason uh, to not expect that. I mean, seven starters back uh, on uh, defense, eight starters back on offense, and and you know they did they did a lot with very little back this past year. And uh, I think that uh, Ohio State fans are, are pinning their hopes on 2017 as being the year that this uh, this team and this program really come into. Uh, to prominence again, and are, are you know it's hard to say. You come off of a playoff berth, uh, but you did get drummed out of the playoffs pretty pretty easily. So now it's uh, what can you do to take that next step and get back to the championship game? And fixing the offense is job one, I think, at this point. This coaching staff is amazing. Starting at the top with head coach Urban Meyer, coordinators Greg Schiano, now Kevin Wilson, and right on down. I just could not be more impressed with this coaching staff that's been assembled. Uh, great stuff, as always, from Steve Hellwagon. Thank you very much, Steve. And thanks to all the listeners out there for tuning into the show. I appreciate it. I hope you all have a great day. Let's hear some Buckeye swag, best damn band in the land. Buckeye, 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 Buckeye.